So my name is Sebastian Dashner. I work for this company called IBM as a developer advocate, and I do a lot in the Java space. But being more productive and um, effective as a developer is a topic near to my heart. And actually, the most important information about myself is not even on that slide, and that is I'm German, right? <laughs> and that's what we're known for, right? We are supposed to be effective. Fun fact about Germany, there ain't no fun in Germany. Go back to work. <laughs> OK, yes, that's what we're going to do. And I'm going to show you seven principles that, when followed, will make you more effective and more productive as a software developer. So let's start just right away. Principle one is embrace automation. Wherever you find it, wherever you find a possibility, try to automate stuff. Why? Because automation is using a computer in a correct way. Computers are actually not very intelligent, although AI is trying to tell us uh, otherwise. Computers, are very stupid, can execute only very stupid things, but they execute them very reliably and very, very fast. Right? But humans, however, are better at design thinking, at creativity, at thinking about a problem and then, ideally, we as a software developer use the computer to automate whatever we're we supposed to do. So don't try to use the computer by executing, uh, executing a lot of manual work, cumbersome, repetitive tasks that are actually not that quite fun to, to deal with, right? Like building, compiling, testing stuff manually. You can automate. And automation comes in many, many forms. Can have big uh, forms or you know, small ways. And one way, in any way, is use shortcuts. Whatever you do, there's probably an easier way to around, an easier way to do whatever you're trying to do. And depending on the uh, technology and um, software you're using, so this is very technology and agnostic, it can have many forms. So a, pr a program that we all use and love is our IDE, right, or our text editor. And there are a lot of things um, to automate there and a lot of shortcuts that we can leverage and that we should leverage in order to become more productive. So a very basic example here, I have a um, well, Maven project that actually doesn't matter that much. I have my fa uh, favorite IDE of choice. That happens to be IntelliJ. And if we now create a new class, I'm going to show you a few things where we can automate stuff. Right? If we had a class hello, where we would write some Oh, you saw that? What I just did? Public, static, void, main, you know, string, arcs, and all the typos. If you type it yourself, there's probably a way uh, to automate that. Let's talk about live templates in a second. But what do, you do, what do you do, for example, if you're coding, you know, you're doing this, and then afterwards you're doing that, and you're doing something else. If you have, you know, you, a bunch of code, if your code becomes more complex, you want to uh, refactor it, right? So what we're going to do, we take these two lines and you know extract them, factor them out into, of course, a private static void. Do this and that, and then we're going to go and copy paste this around. And then hopefully we go and forget to call our method, right, and stuff like that. This is how we typically program, like you know, copy paste programming. But of course, that's not the best idea, right? Because what happens then? You forget stuff. And what we actually want to do, we want to use some action. For example, right-click, refactor, extract, method, do this and that. And then it will be done automatically, right? OK, you didn't see that. Let's do it again. Right-click, refactor, extract, method, do this and that. Very nice. And if you've done that a bunch of times, then you actually get quite tired of right-click, refactor, extract, method. And then you just uh, find out there's actually a shortcut, Control-Alt-M, to do the same. And a shortcut even to go back, Control-Alt-N. There we go, right? So then you can uh, factor that out, this and that, and do something else down here. And if you're very intelligent, you say, oh, if you would change this signature, then I could even, well, whatever. 
You get the point? Try to use shortcuts. Whatever you are doing, there's probably a shortcut for it. If you extract something from your class, if you want to introduce a delegate, if you want to um, um, extract an interface, stuff like that, there's probably a shortcut for it. And that's what we try to uh, leverage. Why? Because first of all, as you just see, saw, typing all that stuff and copy-pasting takes more time. You know? It's not that fun. It just you know, takes more energy. And second, there's a danger that, you know, for example, trying to uh, forget something that you forget to uh, try to call the method. Right? So that just makes more sense. And this is actually what we should focus on. Because these problems, you know, what you would um, factor out here, uh, which abstraction layer you would craft, this is a hard problem to think about, right? That requires um, experience, that requires creativity, how to craft and layer our application here. But then executing it, doing, that's, that's kind of simple, right? That should be done like this, shortcuts, automation. And there are tons and tons and tons method, shortcuts, automation available in your IDE, no matter which uh, one happens to be your choice where you can do that. All right, that's one thing. Another thing that I really love is, uh, what is in IntelliJ, what is called live templates. So this is what you saw there. That basically specifies something that you want to create quickly. All kind of boilerplate code snippets that you would otherwise type by hand. So private string or whatever you t uh, keep typing. Good thing is you can define your own, and you should depending on what technology you're using. So there are a bunch of um, ones that IntelliJ and others come ship with out of the box, for example, this main one. Or if you want to use you know, another framework or a technology that's not supported, define your own. So I use a lot of Java Enterprise technology and CDI and all that stuff. So I keep typing at inject with the correct import all over again. And then I can inject something here, right? And just selecting the correct import is requires energy, right? And if you have something like Singleton, then you don't know which one to choose, and you're always in danger to choose the, correct, uh, to choose the incorrect import. And what you should do instead is just having a small live template, even if it's something simple as at inject. But just by selecting the import statement, I, by the way, type that. That's just me. I defined that. I type that, and then I can inject you know, some bean, and so on and so forth, right? Same as to whatever you're using. If Java Enterprise, you use how many times did I write at persistent context entity manager, entity manager, or managed executor service, right? Or whatever, post construct method, init something, or pre destroy method, right? Or if you're in a test environment, then you know, a test method with the correct import, and if I had the dependency, it would resol resolve it, and so on and so forth. Depending on the technology, you can define your own, all the boilerplate code snippets you keep typing all over again. So who of you is using Kubernetes or anything that requires YAML definition files? Hands up. Who loves YAML? Yeah, over here. Great. So if you, that's just another example, right? Um, deployment, YAML, something like this. Same story. Who of you can remember the definition of a Kubernetes service or deployment out of the head? I can't. Right, right. Something like a service, Kubernetes service. If you're not familiar with Kubernetes, it doesn't matter. Just some whatever specification format where you have to um, define multiple properties, how to set that up. And these services always come, you know, with API version, with a name, hello service, and then a bunch of other things, port definitions. And if I were to write that myself, or if I always had to look into your documentation, that's quite cumbersome, right? Same for, or even worse, for a Kubernetes deployment. You define all kind of stuff here. Set up yourself a live template, and you can define your own for whatever technology you're using. Shortcuts, in general, for whatever application you're using. IDE is a big one. Or you know, any application you ha seem to use a lot, try to become a power user of that. Try to look into you know, the help, the documentation, if there are some shortcuts available. Unfortunately, for most of the app or many applications, that's not always the case. So not all of the applications are actually usable via nice shortcuts or macros, whatever you do. Uh, fun fact, I, I even hacked once. Uh, it was not Excel, but LibreOffice for Visual Basic macros to do my taxes because I had to you know, edit some 
you know, spreadsheets and then I was typing the same actions all over again and inserting the same fields, you can fire up a, mac a macro for that, right? Requires some time, but it pays off. Automation, writing shortcuts. Another big one, and I'm a huge fan of the command line, is that try to use the command line, especially the Unix one, and the power of Unix. Why? Well, if you're in the command line, you can do virtually anything your computer can do, especially if you use a Linux environment, but in general, and it will make you really productive if you use stuff like that. So that's a command line. That's a test project, um, what you just saw, with all these, you know, POM XML and stuff like that. Who of you uses Bash, first of all? Hands up. Bash. Who of you uses a different one, for example, Z shell. Okay. Any other command line shells? Fish shell, whatever is there, born shell, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't know much about the others. So I'm not very religious which shell you would use, but I challenge you to give Z shell a try. Let me tell you why. First of all, you don't have to learn anything else. Everything you would do in Bash works in Z shell just fine and much more. It can actually do much, much more. But only two reasons to change, which made me change. First of uh, all, you can switch directories without typing CD. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Wait for it. It sounds like, yeah, whatever, like a super small improvement. But if you happen to use the command line a lot, and actually I'm in the command line the whole time, I do virtually everything there. I don't even have a file explorer. I use you know, the files and everything like this. Once you fasten that, it, it works really well. So that means if you, um, you want to go to temp test project, you can simply type it without typing CD. And if it's a valid directory, it will lead you there. Once you're used to it, you never want to go back. And the second one, which is even a bigger one, you can auto expand multiple directory hierarchies by tap, uh, hitting tab once. So instead of saying go to temp tab, test project tab, source tab, main tab, Java tab. You say temp test project source main Java, hit tab once, <laughs> and then you're there. Just saying, do whatever you like, but you want to give it a try. And once you are there, because, I mean, I'm just saying, I, I go into project and I see people using like this, CD, CD, oh, back CD, CD, Really? Well, just saying. That's my, uh, my opinion. And what's even bigger, and what I really like, shell aliases. What is an alias? Alias is one of the hugest um, productivity enablers for shell usage, for command line usage, for, again, whatever you're doing. So who of you, who of you uses Git? Hands up. Git. How many times do you type Git status? or git commit, or git push, or git push origin master, right? So why do you type this, and why you not just uh, go faster and type that? Git status, or git commit, or git push, oops, into the correct branch, right? Or, you know, git whatever you like. You're just faster by doing that. Who of you uses Maven to build the project, right? Maven? Yeah. So how many times did you type this, Maven clean install, or Maven, maybe Maven clean package, or maybe just Maven package, right? And why don't you use like this, Maven clean package? And then you build it, and there you go. Same with Maven clean install. Or actually, you know, if, if we're honest to ourselves, it's actually this, right? <laughs> Maven clean install and skip the tests. So whatever, you keep typing all over again, define an alias, and it will be faster. And you can build quickly without tests. So go and define aliases for them. Who of you uses Docker, right? Ever type that? Docker PS, Docker build, Docker push. Who of you uses Kubernetes? Kube control, give me the services. Kube control, give me the parts. Kube control, apply the following to my cluster, and so on and so forth. Whatever you're using, Try to define an alias, try to find out, define an alias for it, and you will be faster, just like this. A good way to start is your um, Z shell history, 
or your bash history. Look into that file, sort it by usage, and see the top commands that you keep typing all over again. And these are good ways to start um, defining aliases for them. Very helpful. Then, of course, at the source of automation, shell scripts, keep calm and bin bash. A huge enabler, especially on, on a Linux environment or in general on a Unix environment where you can do virtually anything in a command line if you just type commands. If you go that, take that one step further, what are shell scripts? Well, you literally take these commands, put it into a file, make it executable, done. There's your automation, and then you can simply run it, whatever you're doing. right? And this can be very simple steps that then enable you to throw away many, many other tools. If you're on the command line, it can be super simple. right? If you build your project using Maven, then you build a Docker image, you push that Docker image, you deploy it somewhere to Kubernetes. You don't even have to have a cumbersome Maven something plugin structure set up. You can simply say, write a shell script, Maven clean package, Docker build, Docker push, kube control apply. There you go, for example. So automation is the key there. What else it enables you is to focus on what's actually important, because then it can just automate stuff. No, it doesn't matter which technology you're using. So I'm a lot in software, um, enterprise software space. So if, for example, you write some code, and then what I just mentioned, you build a Docker container, you deploy it somewhere, you can automate all that stuff. Even in a local environment, that depends a lot how you build locally, especially if you're doing development, you want to minimize the uh, turnaround times, right? Once you edit some code, you hit save, or you, know, you do one action, one click, one hit of a keystroke, then the automation should come into play. Or even automatically, if you just save a file, and that can trigger some action. So for example, again, this is just my examples. Let's get rid of this. What I use Java Enterprise a lot, so I have a Maven project that happens to build Java E8, whatever. And if I now would just write some super basic code, uh, um, HTTP over, you know, uh, hello world over HTTP, path hello, right? And then string, if I could type hello, <coughs> bless you. So we write a super interesting hello world example. Exciting, I know. So what this is going to do, Java Enterprise application, it says, well, hello. So if we're uh, about to build this, maybe clean package, so you saw what I did there. Then what in this case you get is, you know, whatever uh, deployment, uh, war file in this case for uh, thin de deployment artifacts. And then for Docker, you would write a Docker file. Again, I wrote so many Docker files, I got lazy of it. So of course, I have, let's use Open Liberty, I have a script for it that then creates a Docker file because I'm too lazy to even write two lines of code. And that creates um, Docker for my special Open Liberty in this case. And then what it can do is a Docker build to set that all up. What it can also do, there is uh, one, and this is uh, specific to, to Java Enterprise deployments, there is one quite helpful um, tool out there by Adam Bean called uh, Watt, Watch and Deploy, where you can take that, listen for file changes so you don't even have to trigger an action, and it will you know, deploy your application somewhere, and that somewhere can even run inside of a Docker container. So what you could do is uh, build that uh, into a Docker um, container, and then it will build uh, and run that container and watch for, um, watch for changes. Um, so what we have here uh, is the hello resource that simply you know, deploys that application, in my case, to Open Liberty, which is, by the way, also super fast uh, once you want to redeploy stuff. So if I go, now it's already um, deployed here. And if I go, you saw another alias? Curl localhost 9080. How many times did I type that? Test uh, project resources. Uh, hello, that should hopefully work. Yes, it says hello. And then what you could do, simply just um, change that and update the file. And I'm just closing that because of uh, the autosave of IntelliJ. And then uh, what works. So this is now an IntelliJ thing that once it saves uh, the file, then it's a little bit big. I could do this a little bit smaller with all the warnings ignored. So what it does, it watches your directory during development that you simply can you know, focus on developing some code. And at some point, you just hit reload, and then it will have your changes there. 
you know, without doing anything else. So that's a nice story of this watch tool, watch and deploy. You don't even have to you know, save a file. Um, very similar two weeks ago, last two weeks ago, the Quarkus, new shiny tool in Java Enterprise, if you heard about that, um, has been around. Um, you can have a look at, at that as well. What I like about this, it enables you to have super fast turnaround times as well by um, redeploying just very quickly. And you can simply focus on what you want to do. Focus on writing code and not you know, executing and building your whole pipeline and redeploying your application, which in the past took like minutes or even more. So I have a personal rule, what I call a productive de uh, de development. If I change something, like I just did from, um, where's my class? Hello? From exclamation mark to dot and back. If I change something, and if I, oh, I don't have a coffee. If I take one sip of my coffee, you know, and drink it, and in that time, it should redeploy and do its automation. If it takes longer, that's too slow, right? Because if it takes longer than, let's say, 10 seconds, what happens is developers get distracted, right? You're just sitting there like, yeah, please redeploy a little bit faster. Oh, let's check the emails. Oh, what's new on Twitter or on Facebook, right? And then immediately your focus is gone. So try to enable automation to just have quick turnaround times. And then, you know, after you drank your coffee, oh, I just said that. Did I change it back? Oh, no. Oh, that's probably because of the autosave. Sometimes IntelliJ, uh, because of the autosave, doesn't immediately have to file switch. Let's wait for that. Oh, yeah. As you can see, that was, that was not done yet. Oh, now we go. Sometimes that takes a bit, you know, sip of a coffee, and then you can see that's there. So just much faster than waiting for a slow deployment. If we think of automation, what it is, in a nutshell, is that we define, well, stuff as code, right? So not only our source code as code or configuration as code, um, what we have if you, you know, define some configuration files or infrastructure as code, think of Docker files, Kubernetes, YAML deployments. That's the power of this cloud-native technology, that you define what you want to do as code, and then you can automate it, right? So no need to manually install Open Liberty and uh, Java, there's a Docker file that does it for you. And ultimately, you can do everything as code if you're creative at that, right? Um, when I got this laptop, it took me like 15 minutes to set it up, including all programs, you know, personal um, settings and all that stuff. Because if you're, especially if you're on Linux, you can automate things right away because you can do virtually anything on a command line and then write some scripts, for example, you know, apt-get install this and that, and then you can just set up whatever you need and maintain these scripts for you know, a setup of a new machine or whatever you're doing. So every once in a while, try to take a step back and look at all the minor, the big and small tasks you do every day and see whether there's something you could automate there. That's a good principle to follow, three-strike principle, right? If you do something that you do manually first time, it is OK if you do it manually. Second time, you get annoyed, but it's still OK. And the third time, you lose your patience. You say, now I won't do the task, and now we'll write an automation that does the task. That's a good principle to follow. What else should be automated is, of course, testing. And not only should we automate and run tests, but we should also validate whatever we're testing in an automated way. And I don't want to hear any excuses on, oh, we do this super special thing, including UIs and you know, special devices. You can virtually test anything in an automated way. There are UI tests that take screenshots of videos and automatically compare them and alarm you if they differ. Um, you can find virtually any creative way. Again, that's what we're good at as humans, creati uh, creativity, uh, creativity uh, thinking about a pro um, problem, and then writing some automation, writing some code, executing some, uh, some, or specifying something that will be executed by the computer to do the job. If we take that further, of course, we end up at continuous delivery. So not only we specify how we build and um, compile our program, we also you know, specify the whole pipeline. Where, how do we get from our source code to a running environment? Right? By defining all these steps in an automated way. And that is only enabled by having 
automated tests, by the way, and ha by having sufficient test coverage that does the whole thing on its own without human intervention required. That's very important, and that's the only enabler to move fast in this fast-moving world. All right, principle two. Try to focus and eliminate context switches. So if you know about CPUs, processors, they have quite a penalty to pay if you switch the context from one to the other. You know, you have to reload your registers and you know, your pipeline needs to be cleared and all that stuff. And humans have an even much, much, much higher penalty to pay once we have to switch our context, right? Multitasking is a lie, especially if you want to do some actual work, if you, wanna, so, uh, if you have a task at hand where you need to focus on. Everybody you know, can drive a car and think about a problem at the same time, you know, because once that becomes a habit of driving that car, but if you think about a, a hard problem to solve, that's not a habit yet because you're solving it for, for the first time, right? So you need to focus. And every time you switch the context from run to something else, then you totally lose it. Because we have a lot of small and tiny things we need to load up into a short-term working memory in order to work on a problem, right? You need to have all these classes and types you have in an application in your head to say, oh, which type does this and where's the responsibility of that? And it takes some time, a few minutes, to build up that context until you actually can be productive. And once you get distracted, then, you know, that is totally lost. Also, there are a lot of big and small context switches that you do. And a big one of mine, I'm a huge keyboard lover. So if you want to be productive, then take your mouse and throw it away. Why? Because you're much faster, actually, at typing on your keyboard. I mean, that's obvious because you have 10 fingers and hopefully and a lot of keys available. So you can type uh, much faster. And this is what we developers should do, right? We should type, it, type our, uh, our code. And every time you switch, by only doing, and that is a context switch, by doing from, going from here to there to your mouse, where's my mouse, oh, and back, or even to your touchpad down there or whatever it is, you're moving something. You're moving your hands away from where they're supposed to be, which is your home row on the keyboard, right? F and J. That's where your hands are supposed to be. So, talking about that, what I'm also a big fan of is get yourself a proper keyboard. Right. Because if you keep typing a lot, and you will, hopefully, you keep typing for hours and hours a day. Right. And once you get ho your hands on a proper keyboard, you never want to go back and you miss the typing experience. And it actually makes you much more effective if you can type properly. So I don't want to do any advertise uh, advertisement, just as you know, some inspiration. This is what I used before. That's a nice brand with the German name Das Keyboard. <laughs> das is the article. <laughs> Uh, which I used before, they come with cherry switches. If uh, you want to annoy your coworkers, take some cherry blue switches. No, don't do them. They should be forbidden in an open office. They are super loud and clicky. I had them before, and actually, I now prefer like the lighter touch. Uh, what I have right now, uh, that's a Japanese brand, Topper, um, with capa uh, capacitive switches. They have a little bit lighter touch. Depends what, you, uh, what your preference is. Try, uh, you can try out um, a different ones. Um, my only takeaway for that is we spend a lot of time typing on these things and we should you know, invest some proper money for a proper device because we spend a lot of time on these things. If you think about it, any cra carpenter or any craft worker you know, would also probably not go into the next do-it-yourself store to get their tools. Right? They would buy proper tools because they use, use it all day as a professional work. And this is what what we might think about it, get some professional tools as well, because you use them many hours a day. Who of you, I'm actually not sure about in Romania, who of you uses something else than the US keyboard layout? Like this. You have the US one with the small enter key? Let me check. No, you don't. You're from uh, here? Switzerland. Oh, Switzerland. Oh, the Switzerland. Oh my god, that is the worst <laughs> keyboard ever invented. You know, try to find some curly braces. That's insane. I would usually say um, the German one is pretty bad because if you um, think of it, the, the curly braces, which we as Java uh, programmers, you know, at least need once in a while. There's a curly brace here. And oh, there are even a lot of curly braces, right? So you need them. 
And in the German keyboard layout, you have to press like alt graphics and is it seven or eight or something? You know, like ugh, weird movement. No, don't do that. So my advice, and I know what I'm talking about because I grew up in a country where you have German keyboard layouts, try to use the uh, English keyboard layout. And now if you tell me, oh, we in this country where we have this umlauts and accents and all kind of weird characters, uh, well, there's actually in US international keyboard layout uh, with all graphics and no dead keys. That's my personal favorite. So you, you see all kind of uh, weird characters that you can type uh, from these Swedish O's and German umlauts and all kind of stuff, uh, where hopefully everything you need to type is there as well. So this is actually what I need, uh, what I use right now. And if I write a German email, then you know I have my own umlauts available with all graphics as well. Um, huge enabler. Why? Because your special characters that you need as a developer are here handy, where you don't have to uh, press another modifier key, which is very helpful as well. Just saying. Another topic. Yeah, I know. I know, right? That's a good one. Everybody keeps, uh, keeps laughing now. I soon have to leave the room, I guess. No, uh, honestly, one way of typing. So actually, that's a topic that turned out to be the biggest productivity enabler during my career, probably which is the whim way of typing, or as I would say it, um, call it the whim way of thinking even. And I'm not talking about the editor. Uh, let me tell you a story. It was, wow, four years ago already, uh, when I attended uh, a Java conference in Germany, and I met this uh, great uh, guy, I don't know whether, you, whether or not you know him, Dan Allen, uh, who does a lot with documentation and ASCII doctor. He's the lead behind the ASCII doctor and ASCII doc project. And uh, we were chatting about, you know, um, plain text documentation uh, formats and all that stuff. And sitting in front of his computer, and he was he was using Vim, and he was you know typing in his editor and weirdly uh, weirdly um, throwing around the cursor from up to bottom and back and from word to word. And it was almost if you watched him, it was seriously like magic, as if he, he controlled his thoughts and just controlled the cursor by his thoughts where he wanted to be, and just super quickly editing text and flying around his editor. And this is when I uh, finally thought, OK, now I have to go into this Vim thingy and you know, try out that editor that nobody knows how to, how to exit. <laughs> so um, the main thing about that is, and again, it's not about the editor. It's more about the concept is two main concepts. Uh, first of all is the principle that you keep your hand, hands where they're supposed to be, home row, F and J, and nowhere else. And the second is composable commands. So how does that work? If you think of a text editor where you can type in, if you say you want to move around your cursor, for example, or jump around somewhere or execute some command by staying on the home row, this doesn't work, right? Because if you want to type something here, then you know your letters are already occupied. So what you need to do is actually you overload them with multiple layers of um, your editing, where you normally start in this so-called normal mode. This is where, uh, what everybody con is get, gets confused on, because initially you cannot type. You have to spe type a special character in order to type. And then you can type right away. And then if you're in the normal mode, you use the same keys to move around or to execute some actions, right? So if I would do a lot of hello, if I would have an action, for example, you know, move, move one word forward or move one word backward, or you know, move left, right, up and down, and so on and so forth, you can combine that and compose it to commands. For example, delete one word forward. You can do this here, and then you can you know, repeat it over there, or substitute one word forward, and you can do it then again. right? And you can combine these commands. right? So you can say delete one line down, and then you delete um, the, these lines. And once you get used to that, and I know this is not very easy to get used to, but once you're in that mode, simply editing that file almost you know, disappears in your head. You stop thinking about it, and it's almost like you, know, you've, you really are in the editor and just use it right away, almost with the control of your thoughts. You can uh, type as fast, or you can move around as quickly as you think by just um, executing these commands. It becomes very naturally. And again, it's not really about the editor. I use the Vim editor now a lot as well. But as you saw my crazy IDE, 
I use the same thing here. So this is why my cursor looks that uh, crazy. So there's a Vim ID, a Vim plugin, and that's available for all, all IDEs, even for browsers. And you can Vimify everything if you want. And actually, this is something you probably will get into it, <laughs> because you see how productive it is. You literally get rid of all the uh, hand movement context switches. Right? You don't have to context switch from here to down the cursor keys or to your mouse and where's my mouse and where do you have to click in order to switch environment and back. You literally use your keyboard for everything. So that's also the reason why I use this weird, um, let's close this again, weird window ma manager where I switch around. You know? That's literally, I, I don't use my mouse. Right? I use the keyboard for everything in order to navigate. And it's much faster. As a matter of fact, I even created a shortcut to move my mouse out of the way, right? Because you know that feeling when you edit something and then suddenly your mouse is kind of in the way? So I have a shortcut. What is it? Control um, Super M. Well, that just you know, gets pushed out of the way. Because the context switch of going from here to take your mouse and, <laughs> and back is too big. You can do that much faster by just assigning a shortcut for it. And it's, you know. German, I know. <laughs> Effectivity. So maybe that's only me. But you might uh, think about that in order to become more productive at using and leveraging your keyboard shortcut in order to eliminate these small context switches. What else? Less technological, more mindset is I really like the concept of blinders. And this might be me because I get distracted actually fairly easily. Um, what I like is if I want to focus on something, I only want to see that and virtually blind everything else away. So what you see here, this is actually not a special presentation environment, what I have. This is my normal setup, like this, or you know, actually not, sometimes like this. You saw it? I, I moved away this small like taskbar because I want to focus on what I currently am focusing on and not seeing anything else. And that starts from, I use this Linux environment because it works for me, because out of the box it ships with nothing, which is good. So nothing that will distract me. So there's uh, virtually only the thing I'm working in. And the same here, you know, in the command line. It has this command line or the two ones, or I can, you know, have a full screen. I love full screen environments because I'm thinking of one thing and this should consume the whole screen. Great. And that's what I'm working, uh, working on. And I like to um, blend out everything else. Besides the screen, there are also other things to blend out. And some of you are laughing, but I'm actually not kidding. I purchased a pair of these and also some custom tailored um, earplugs because I get quite distracted by noise and I tend to travel a lot. So there's a lot of uh, noise out there in the world. And what you need to do is manage the distractions and try to focus. And this is, you know, kind of a personal topic, whatever works for you. So I get distracted by noise a lot. I try to blend that out. And also um, what is called visual noise, right? If you see, uh, sit somewhere and a lot of you know, movement around you can become quite distractive as well. So I like, I like to focus on that. And another thing is everything inside your computers, all your distractions, notif sorry, not all your notifications are distractions, are bad. Why? Because we should focus on one thing. And wherever you have some notification that pops up, even if it's not important right now, what it does, it distracts you. And it will require, even whether you like it or not, it will require a small context switch. So if you got that email over there or that Slack message, bing, then you see it and then you're like, no important, go away. But then immediately you lost some energy and you lost some focus by thinking about it. And you might be like, oh, was that an email important? Oh yeah, that was this dude talking to that other uh, guy and so on and so forth, right? Whether you or not you like it, you will think about it. When I work, I, dis I disable all of the distractions. All of them. No email, no Slack, no notification, no, this is why I use uh, uh, Linux, no Windows update, and do a Windows update right now, and there's nothing you can do that is uh, even more important than the Windows update right now. No, nothing. No phone. There's a super awesome feature on every phone, also uh, probably on your phone, that is called flight mode. I'm not kidding. I use that all the time because then there's zero distractions. There's no way that this thing will distract me because I want to wo uh, work on something right now. And that is, you know, in order to manage um, these distractions. Same goes for coworkers. So 
Let's have a small cartoon here. Our developer dude wants to work on something. I don't know whether you can read that. And you know, we're building up this complex tree. And hmm, what if I put that over there? Oh, yeah, that could work. And then, of course, somebody else comes in and say, hey, do you have a second? And what happens is you're totally lost in space. You know, your brain is somewhere down on the floor. And you're like, oh, what? And of course, that other person says, oh, never mind. <laughs> it was actually not that important. But still, you totally lost track, and you're uh, asking yourself, what was I doing? And this is you know, the power or the problem of context switches. Whatever you're working on right now, it requires a lot of short-term memory. It's inherently a complex work that we're doing as developers, so we need to be able to focus. That's kind of important. And of course, that goes with working environments. Uh, that picture was taken on the island of Crete in Greece. There was a, no kidding, a Java on conference called jCrete. Maybe you've heard of it. And of course, that's a super nice and relaxing environment. You spend some time at the ocean, and you might think, oh, this very much sounds like vacation. But what happens, at least in this uh, on conference, is that you, bless you, that you work for like half of the day, maybe four hours or something like that. And of course, the rest of the time, you enjoy yourself on the beach, somewhere else, going to restaurants. But these four hours of working are far more productive than eight hours in a noisy and disruptive office. So if you can work where your mind is totally at ease, you're relaxed, you have your inner peace, you can just focus, nobody will distract you, this is highly productive. And, well, I can say that quite easily because um, well, in the last four years, I was self-employed, so I was working on my own, you know, without a team, without all these annoying uh, colleagues. <laughs> and now I work in, you know, a team that is highly uh, distributed, so all of my four colleagues are actually based in the U.S., so I probably they're still sleeping, so that's easy for me. But it's true for any team that you're working with, right? Because what we all want to do is, you know, work on some meaningful work, being able to focus, and everybody will understand if you say, hey, I need some quiet hours for one hour or at least 30 minutes, it should be okay to fully unplug, to close Slack and emails and everything, and tell your colleagues, hey, I will, I will get back to that super important email within 30 minutes or more, right? So that should be okay, and usually it is okay or if it's not, then at least set up a highly, highly important emergency channel where somebody can call you if actually something is really important and then you're available. But other than that, it should be fine to disappear for at least 30 minutes or 60 minutes if your team knows about it. And then you can go back, you can chat with your colleagues, you can open up your email and respond to that important email or in Slack, go back, and then again, go back into focus mode and try to work on what's actually important. So that should be... That should be done if you want to be if you want to be productive and get some actual work done. Principle three, and we will uh, we were already talking about that a little bit uh, when it came to automation. So what you should do every once in a while, take a step back and really ask yourself, what am I doing the whole day? Really. Um, my company, IBM, has this nice motto, think, and this should be done more, think. Think about the work and actually, you know, is there a better way? You know, first of all, what are, what are we doing? Does that even make sense? Or, you know, the type of work, the, um, num um, the type of tasks you're executing to get there, is there a better way around? Or at least is there an easy way um, around in order to automate it or in order to, you know, take some shortcuts in one way or the other? or even get rid of some cumbersome processes. So try to um, enable that. Principle four, that's a funny one. Principle of don't make me think, or at least don't make me think twice. So that means whenever you find yourself in that deja vu moment where you're in the same thought loops all over again, how again did I set up this, you know, production server or deploy to uh, whatever environment? And you know that last week you asked yourself the same question, so then, you know, you should do some steps. For example, if you say, how do you de uh, deploy to that environment, and then the question how you actually do that 
That's an interesting and hard question to think about, but you should solve that only once, right? And then ideally, you know, write that down somewhere or even better yet, automate it, right? And automation in that case can become some documentation in that form, right? So if you're asking yourself all over again, oh, how again do I de uh, deploy to that environment? Well, then either look into the documentation or better yet, the automation can become or is a form of documentation. How do you deploy into that environment? Well, look into the script, look into the routine or into the, uh, the tool that you're using, and it's literally right there how it is documented to do that. And you can even execute it, and we'll do the step for you. So that's another thing to uh, think about, and well, uh, that is quite helpful. Another thing in order to don't make me think, at least don't make me think twice, is record what you're doing and also keep a to-do list. <laughs> no, really. Yes, I'm really telling you this super awesome trick, <laughs> secret uh, tip of keeping a to-do list. Well, probably everybody of you has, uh, has one, and this is a huge topic on its own. What I like about to-do lists, first of all, it enables you to have peace of mind. Why? Because if I think about something that needs to be done, I don't want to store that in my head constantly. So I believe that the brain is not a storage unit, but a processing unit. So don't keep these things in your head and try to memorize a lot of uh, stuff uh, over there. But write it down somewhere, and then you can you know, um, deal with it later. And again, you can focus on the task at hand. Um, another thing, um, or well, multiple things, um, if you keep uh, a to-do list, so during my uh, career, I wrote at least, no kidding, three to-do list applications myself, right? Who of you wrote a to-do list app, you know, a Hello World to-do list before? Yeah, at least a few. So um, what I like, uh, dislike about most of the to-do list apps or how they're being used is if you open up your to-do list and then immediately what happens is you immediately get distracted, right? You see that huge amount of task of work that has not been done yet, these hundreds of entries that totally distract you immediately, right? You look at that and, oh, yeah, I still need to do this. Oh, my God, I need to contact that person. And I need to do that as well. And then you're totally, you know, totally demotivated to do anything, um, anything there. So what I can advise you is keep a small to-do list based on the week or maybe the month the sprint, the quarter, whatever, or ideally the day. What am I supposed to do tomorrow? Prioritize them by sorting. Do the first thing first, and then you know you can go from top to bottom each and every day. Keep a done section where you track everything that you've done that day. And again, it's really not about the tool or implementation you're using. What it can do is, again, use the command line on something simple like a text file um, to do's text from today. To do's. This is ASCII doc format, but doesn't matter. Do this. Do that. Done. Right. And then you can um, uh, reprioritize if you like. And then at the end, just keep it. Right. Keep that list. And at the end of the day, you can, uh, if your manager comes in and asks, um, what did you do? the whole month, well, you just tell them, you know, I've done this and that. Something simple like that, right? You don't have to do this structure, but you get my point. You don't have to use an overly complicated tool. It's much more about the process you're using and the approach to not get distracted. So then if you look at your daily to-do list, it's much more manageable. And at the end of the day, you go over everything that has been done. You can transfer it to the next day. Think about the high priority, most important thing for the next day. And that's super simple. And you won't get overwhelmed by the hundreds of tasks that are in your backlog that have not been done yet. Another part that always distracted me, if I work on something, and you might or might not have experienced that. So I work on something here. I'm coding. And then out of nowhere, out of the blue, I get this random thought. And oh, I still need to contact that person. I still need to do that. Right? Do you know this feeling? Maybe? 
So what then happens, you want to open up your to-do list to you know, store that thought, otherwise you could distract it by constantly thinking about that small tiny thing, and then put it and add it into your to-do list. But then you open up that to-do list with the hundreds of entries, and then you immediately get distracted of, yeah, I still have to not done this, and so on and so forth. And what you actually want to do is working on the problem at hand, right? So what you do instead, again, automation or command line tools if you want, what you can do, if I could type, you write a script or you do something where you just keep hit enter and it's gone. And it will be somewhere and you appended it on some file at the end and you deal with it later and you have peace of mind and you can return to your problem at hand without looking at the hundreds of things that you have not done yet. So you don't get distracted. Just the small things that helped me over that. Another principle, principle of knowing your craft, of <laughs> actually knowing what you're doing, as stupid as it sounds, because this is what I like or dislike um, about computer science. Computer science, and this is uh, probably one of the reasons why we developers are really highly demanded in the industry, because IT and computers are very hard, are very rough, and not really nice to us if we work on, a pr um, on something in code and we forget to add the semicolon or we forget to add, you know, to write the proper syntax or just forget one tiny lines of code. As human, we would think of, oh, come on, don't be that mean. I, I just, you know, it's, it's just semicolon, you know, wh whatever. It's just this line, just add it or whatever. Why don't you work for like, I tried, on this, uh, I tried to solve this for hours and it didn't work. But that's a part that we, you know, that, that we need to know. You can do a lot of things with you know, minimal work. We developers, we can write a few lines of code. If you know which lines of code you have to write, then you can enable a lot of work. But this is not trivial. You have to know what you're doing. You have to know where that missing, um, missing character is. You have to know, well, your craft. And this will make you much, much more productive to actually go and Read the documentation. No, really, I'm not kidding. I cannot tell you how many times I was working on a problem for like hours. You know, all of us know that as developers, right? You look into something and ah, oh, this didn't work, and then you try again, and you try an error or something else. You look at Google and Stack Overflow. You copy paste some code over there. You try it again, and then after a few hours, you finally lose patience and say, "Okay, fine." I will go and have a look at the documentation, right? And then, no kidding, after like 15 minutes, you're like, oh, of course, it cannot work because, you know, that's not supposed to be used in that way or you forgot to add about this and that concept. And if you go and read the documentation, maybe even first or sometimes just for fun in order to know more about the language and layer you're using, whatever technology that is, it will make you much, much more productive. And especially how I see it is that open source um, documentation and projects get better and better. Like prime examples, for, uh, for example, are Docker or Kubernetes. It's a really good documentation where it tells you about the concepts and motivations first in order to understand what you're actually doing there then laying out the architecture, how that works, and of course how we users use that technology, just as an example. And that is super important because then you go and use it right, the, uh, right, right away, just like this, right? Because using it is not, is not hard, you know? You can do a lot of stuff in, let's say, 100 lines of codes or even less if you know which 100 kind of lines of codes you have to write. So that's, that's a big one. Another principle. Principle six is communicate. Communicate what you're doing. And that, again, has many, many forms. And it also means write documentation. No, really, I mean it. And not just out of altruism or out of love for your colleagues, even for yourself, right? They say that code you have written half a year ago looks to yourself as if somebody else wrote it. I think that's not true. 
I think that's the case even after two weeks, at least for me. If I look at something I done two, two weeks ago, I was like, who wrote this and why, right? So document, even for yourself, all the intentions, not what you're doing because it's written right there, but why did you choose this? Why use that way? Uh, use it that way. What was the motivation be behind it? Well, what was the bigger picture that you had in mind? can be, again, something simple like, you know, to do whatever text file where you just say this and this and this and these are the next step and that's the overall goal, whatever. Just for yourself without be becoming overly complex and, God forbid, use uh, Word documents or uh, some crazy stuff like that. Super simple. It's uh, just about documenting for yourself. And, of course, go and share knowledge. Can be as simple as peer programming or telling your coworker how to use your project, your technology, that thing you're working on, or even some specific um, specific tools, specific technology, some architecture, some overall idea behind uh, computer science. And sharing knowledge in general requires you to know and dig know more and dig deeper. Teaching is the best way of learning, and it doesn't have to be you know in front of a uh, conference um, in front of an audience, for example, can be a small brown bag inside uh, for other um, uh, team colleagues uh, of yours, can be, you know, your coworker that you're working with, can be a personal blog, videos, whatever, online content, whatever you're doing. When I started uh, blogging, my own blog, I just did it literally for myself in order to, oh, today I learned about this, let's write some blog about it. And then, of course, if you publish it, you're forced to really know what you're doing, and you will double and triple check whether it's actually true, you know, because you publish it to an other audience. And it will just naturally require you to learn more, and you will totally advance and grow in, you know, the knowledge, which, of course, then again, makes you more knowledgeable and makes you more effective by using it. So that's a good way. Also, it will make you find uh, things, f uh, things faster, because, for example, I... I use my own blog and use Google much many more times than I'd like to admit to literally find a solution for a, pro a problem that I was w blogging about a year ago or something like that. So it can be a quite an enabler for that as well. So as an overview, uh, six of the seven productivity principles right here. Try to embrace automation and focus um, on what you're trying to do, the task at hand, and eliminate context switches. Once in a while, take a step back. Ask yourself what you're doing the whole day and if there is a better way. Then the principle of don't make me think, or at least not don't make me think twice, and document and automate. And of course, know your craft, trying to learn more and share that knowledge to anybody else. And now the seventh principle that might uh, come quite unnaturally is use the safe time to relax, which is probably not very German, or I guess. But because if you dig deeper into this topic and you want to uh, learn uh, more, you will become more productive. And then, you know, you save a lot of time to, in order to become more productive, you know, and you can automate even more to become faster, and this doesn't end really well. And actually, taking breaks is very helpful in order to solve problems. And many times you solve problems by just taking a walk or drinking a coffee, relaxing, actually not doing any work, but subconsciously your brain will still working will be still working and that will save you a lot of time. And having that said, especially as developers, there is no substitute for healthy diets, doing sports, and enough sleep. Thank you very much. <laughs>